We're going to talk today about uh, section 5.3, which uh, we'll learn one of the most important theorems in calculus because it will allow us to compute definite integrals in a much simpler way than taking limits of Riemann sums. If you recall, when we first learned how to take derivatives, or we first learned the definition of the derivative, then we knew that it was defined in terms of a limit. And so to find derivatives, we had to use this limit process, which involved a little bit of algebra trickeration. And yesterday, kind of, or Monday, sort of felt like the same thing. Uh, we have a definition of a, uh, the definite integral in terms of a limit. And to actually get to something that can take a limit takes a lot of algebra. Is there a nicer way? And we'll find out that there is. Okay. But let me uh, remind you of the basic object we're studying in this chapter, uh, as well as talk a, a few, a little bit more about the properties of that object. So anytime you've got a function defined on the closed interval a to b, you can uh, try to see if the definite integral of that function over that interval exists. And the way you define that definite integral is it's a uh, limit of Riemann sums. Each Riemann sum is a sum of products of function values times uh, intervals in x. Okay. This is a limit of sums of areas of rectangles. And what we would hope is that that would have a limit it would be the area that's under the graph of f of x and above the x-axis between the vertical lines x equals a and x equals b. So what are all these things? Delta x is just uh, the width of the interval divided by the number of divisions you're taking. And then you mark off n points equally spaced in between a and b. And then you pick some point in, that in each interval to plug in to the uh, function to make your heights. And if f is nice and continuous, or even a little bit discontinuous, then that integral will exist. And it gets this, you get the same limit no matter what. Sorry, this sounds really loud. You get the same limit no matter what uh, method you use to pick, pick those points. All right. Now, what's this, uh, all this notation about that long s thing? is an integral sign. It says we're taking an integral. The function which appears after the integral sign is called the integrand. It's the thing that you are finding the integral of. The a and the b stand for the upper and lower limits of integration. Okay, So that's the interval that we're finding the area over. And the dx is an indication of the variable that you're integrating with respect to. If you had some expression that had more than one letter in it, how would you know which was the variable? Well, that dx is telling you we're integrating in the x direction. It also forms sort of the other half of the integral sign. Every integral has to have an integral sign on the left side and a differential term that is a d something on the right-hand side. Okay? Without it, it's ambiguous. And this whole process is called integration. All right. Now, we learned also that because the integral is a limit of Riemann sums, then Riemann sums can be used to estimate the integral. And depending on the methods you choose to estimate, you can get better or worse approximations to the actual integral. So here's an example of estimating an integral using a Riemann sum. Let's look at the function 4 over 1 plus x squared uh, and integrate it dx between 0 and 1. Well, we won't integrate it exactly, but we'll estimate the integral using m4. What does m4 stand for? Midpoint rule and four divisions. OK, so if we're dividing the interval 0 to 1 up into four pieces, then we mark off the points between 0 and 1. And each of those points will be 1 fourth apart. So we start with 0, then we go to 1 fourth, 1 half, and 3 fourths. Then what's the next step in general? We pick a point in between each pair of endpoints, right? a point in each interval. And the point that we're going to choose is going to be the midpoint. We've been told to use midpoint rule. So we want to find the midpoint between 0 and a fourth. That would be an eighth. Midpoint between a fourth and a half. That would be 3 eighths. Midpoint between uh, a half and 3 fourths is 5 eighths. And the midpoint between 3 fourths and 1 is 7 eighths. Those are the, function, those are the uh, x's that we will plug into the function. Okay, So we want to take f of 1 eighth times 1 fourth plus f of 3 eighths times 1 fourth, plus f of 5 eighths times 1 fourth, plus f of 7 eighths times 1 fourth. Okay? This is our uh, midpoint rule with four divisions. It should be an approximation to the integral. 
Now, what is this? It's some rational number, right? Everything is a fraction, so we should be able to get it as a single numerator over denominator. Let's play around with this uh, arithmetic a little bit. This is 1 64th. This is 64 64ths. So if you add them together, you get 65 64ths. This is 9 64ths. Add these two together, you get 73 64ths. This is 25 64ths. Add these together, you get 89 64ths. And finally, 113 64ths. Okay, take that 64 and put in the denom numerator, and you've got 1 4th times 4 times, well, the 4s will go away. That's nice. 64 over 65 plus 64 over 73 plus 64 over 89 plus 64 over 113, whatever that is, right? But it's some fraction, okay? And it would be an approximation to this integral. More divisions would mean a better approximation. Okay, so we could go to M8 or M16. When computers are doing numerical integration, they're often doing some kind of rules such as the midpoint rule. All right. Now, what other properties does this integral have? We learned these, and we sort of breeze through their proofs. It's pretty understandable. If you integrate a constant function, then you get that constant times the width of the interval over which you're integrating. And this makes sense because you're basically trying to compute the area of a rectangle. And we know what the area of a rectangle is. It's the product of the length and the height. Integral of a sum is a sum of the integrals. Basically comes down to the fact that each integral is defined in terms of a limit. And the limit of a sum of two things is the sum of the limits of those two things. Multiply a function by a constant. Its integral multiplies by that same constant. Again, it comes from limit laws. And combining those property 2 and property uh, 3 together, you can show that the integral of a difference of two functions is the difference of the integrals of those two functions. So that's pretty straightforward. comes straight from the definition. Once you make these conventions, what it means to integrate in the other direction than normal, then we take that to mean the opposite of the integral in the other direction, the regular direction. And integrating over an interval with no width would be 0. Then we get this property that if I want to integrate from a to c, I can integrate from a to b and add it to it the integral from b to c. We saw two illustrations of that, one in the case that b was in between a and c. Well, the integral from a to b is the area of this piece here. And the integral from b to c is the area of this piece here. And if you put those two pieces next to each other, you have the entire region that you were trying to integrate. Its area would be the integral from a to c. So just by laying it out, it looks like it makes sense. Even if b is greater than c, it's still true that the integral from a to b plus the integral from b to c equals the integral from a to c. And that's because the integral from b to c is going to be negative in this case. It's the opposite of the integral from c to b. So if you go this far, and then you go back, you end up with this area left over. OK, so we did that uh, as well. And we also know that integrals are supposed to compute area. So if I have a function that traces out a region, and I know the area of that region already, then I can use that fact to deduce what the integral is going to be. All right, What I've drawn there is the function square root of 1 minus x squared. And I know that that traces out a quarter circle. So the area of this region is going to be a quarter of the area of the whole circle. The area of the whole circle is pi from the pi r squared formula. And so the area of this quarter circle is pi over 4. All right, so I'm allowed to say that this integral is pi over 4 just by area considerations. Okay. Now that may not be technically very fair because we haven't proven the pi formula. but the Greeks used it, and Jimmy Stewart uses it. Jimmy Stewart, the author of our textbook, not the actor. Uh, so it's good enough for us. OK, and these also we computed using the Cavalieri method of uh, making those limits of sums of rectangles. And we got the integral from 0 to 1 of x squared is 1 third. The integral from 0 to 1 of x cubed is 1 fourth. OK, so that much we know. Here are some other properties of the integral. These are things that I didn't quite get to on Monday. It was ambitious to try to do two sections on Monday anyway. If we've got two functions, uh, then we can make these following comparison statements. First of all, if the function f of x is non-negative over the entire interval a to b, then the integral of f of x is also non-negative, integral over that same interval 
Why should that be? Well, we'll see a picture of that in a second. The other property is that if a function is uh, greater than another function, if f of x is greater than or equal to g of x, then the integral from a to b of f of x is going to be int greater or equal to the integral from a to b of g of x. So we've got two functions. One of them is at least as big. Then the integral of this function is going to be at least as big as this one. Okay. The last property of comparison says that if, I, if my function is greater than or equal to some constant little m and less than or equal to some constant capital M, then the integral is greater than or equal to the constant m times b minus a and is less than or equal to the constant capital M times b minus a. Okay? Just looking at this one, you can see how it comes from property 7 here. Because if f of x is less than or equal to a constant capital M, then the integral of f of x is going to be less than or equal to the integral of the constant capital M. But what's the integral of a constant function? It's that constant times the width of the interval. And that's exactly what this is. So you can do the same thing on that side, too. Okay. Where do all these things come from? Well, here's the picture proof of the fact that if the function is non-negative on the interval a to b, then its integral is supposed to be non-negative. Because what's the integral? It's a limit of Riemann sums. What's a Riemann sum? It's a sum of function values times delta x's. And if the function is non-negative, all of these are non-negative as well. So what I'm adding up is a bunch of things which are greater than or equal to 0. And so their sum is going to be greater than or equal to 0. So all the Riemann sums are greater than or equal to 0. And the, limit is, the integral is a limit of Riemann sums. So it has to be a limit of things which are non-negative, and therefore it's non-negative. All right, great. And the other one, well, a lot of times you can do this kind of trick where you know, when you have two functions and you're comparing them, you can subtract them and compare it to a constant. So if f of x is greater than or equal to g of x, then their difference, h of x, is greater than or equal to 0. And we just said that the integral of a non-negative function is non-negative. So the integral of g h of x is non-negative. But what is the integral of h of x? It's the difference between the integral of f of x and the integral of g of x. Okay, So the difference between these two integrals is non-negative, which means that this one is at least as big as that one. Okay. And here's the same picture proof for that uh, third property. Here's my function. If it's less than or equal to the constant capital M and greater than or equal to the constant small m, then the area which is under the curve here has to be greater than the area of this rectangle and less than the area of this rectangle. Well, what's the area of this rectangle? It's constant m times b minus a. What's the area of this rectangle? It's the constant little m times b minus a. All right, so all those properties are pretty straightforward. Basically, they come from the fact that if you add up a bunch of things which are non-negative and then take the limit, the limit also has to be non-negative. OK, so we can do things like estimating integrals using these comparison properties. Say we wanted to estimate the integral of 1 over x between 1 and 2. Well, if I had a bound for 1 over x, then I could use that and what property 8 here to find estimates of the integral. Well, what's the biggest that 1 over x gets on the interval between 1 and 2? 1, right? And what's the smallest it gets? 1 half. So I can say that 1 over x is in between 1 half and 1 1. And so the integral of 1 over x, whoops, I think I have a, a missing numerator there. 1 over x is greater than or equal to 1 half and less than or equal to 1. So the integral of 1 over x is greater than or equal to 1 half times 2 minus 1, and is less than or equal to 1 times 2 minus 1. So I don't yet know what this integral is, but I can at least say that it's in between 1 half and 1. Okay. How else can we estimate this integral? Uh, we could use the midpoint rule. right? If I wanted to say definitely that this integral was less than something, well, I could use either left uh, endpoints or right endpoints to get a strict comparison. If I were using left endpoints to estimate this integral, would that estimate be greater or less than the actual integral? Let's say I were using Riemann sums, taking left endpoints as my sample points, would that Riemann sum be greater or less than the actual integral? Greater, and why greater? 
That's right. 1 over x, the function decreases. So if I'm plugging in left endpoints, those function values are going to be greater than all the other function values on each piece. So the left-hand endpoint rule is going to give me a Riemann sum which is definitely greater than the area under the curve. And so the limit of that will be greater than the area under the curve. All right. So I could use, say, left-hand endpoints in four intervals. That would give me a number which is greater than this integral. I could use right-hand endpoints and four intervals. That would give me a number which is less than this integral. All right. So this would be a way that I could get upper and lower bounds for the uh, estimation of this integral. OK. So so ends section 5.2. And now we get into section 5.3, which is about another method of evaluating these definite integrals. And I'll talk it through, you, through to you using a sort of Socratic method. Here's a picture of Socrates. So we learned a couple of ways to interpret the definite integral. One of them is area under a curve. But we also know that if the function that you're integrating is velocity measured over time, then the integral measures distance traveled, displacement over time. Okay, displacement is like net distance or signed distance. Okay, and this we figured out just by looking at the units and by saying that if velocity is a, uh, if distance, sorry, if rate or speed is distance divided by time, then speed or velocity times time should give me distance. Okay, so if the integral of velocity is distance, and the derivative of distance is velocity, then we have this relationship between integration and differentiation. We can compute displacement using the definite integral or using something whose derivative is velocity. That is, I can find displacement using the antiderivative of velocity. It's actually kind of cool because differentiation is a pretty straightforward process. Anti-differentiation, not as straightforward, but definitely more straightforward than computing limits of Riemann sums, right? and pulling out all those summation formulas and everything. OK, so that's great. Uh, but this isn't really specific to velocity problems. Any function I look at can be considered the velocity of something. And so its distance would be the antiderivative of that velocity. And so what I have is something called the second fundamental theorem of calculus. It says that suppose you have an integrable function and you can find an antiderivative for that function. That is, you can find a function capital F whose derivative is that integrand. Then you can evaluate the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx by evaluating the antiderivative at f and the antiderivative at b at a, sorry, antiderivative of f at b and the antiderivative of f at a and subtracting those two things. Okay? So this theorem is known as the second fundamental theorem of calculus. And that brings to mind a couple of questions. First of all, where did the first fundamental theorem of calculus go? Was I asleep for that one? No, that's coming on Monday. Why did the author of our textbook put the second fundamental theorem of calculus before the first fundamental theorem of calculus? I don't know. You'll also ask, have to ask him why he calls this theorem the evaluation theorem, since he's the only person in the world to call the fundamental theorem of calculus the evaluation theorem. Um, but that's, that's what it is. Okay? I'm surprised he didn't call it Jimmy Stewart's evaluation theorem. No, no, it's the second fundamental theorem of calculus. OK. I guess it, it's well established what the, which of the two parts, or what the two parts of the fundamental theorem of calculus are. To be honest, some people put, call the first one the second one, and vice versa. But this is definitely one part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. OK. So how does this all work? I want to demonstrate to you why the second fundamental theorem of calculus is what it is. OK, and to do that, I'm going to compute a Riemann sum. But I'm going to compute a Riemann sum in a very special way so that I can evaluate the Riemann sum explicitly. And then I'll be able to take its limit explicitly. So every time I'm finding a Riemann sum, I divide up the interval a to b into n pieces. Each of those pieces is going to be the same amount wide, so the separation is delta x, which is the width divided by the number of intervals. Okay, On each interval, I need to pick, pick a point c sub whatever number of interval I'm looking at. What I'm going to do is choose my ci to satisfy this equation right here. f of xi minus f of xi minus 1 divided by xi minus xi minus 1 equals capital F prime at that point ci. Okay? And when, that's, when I can do that, I know that since the derivative of capital F is little f, 
then I'll have an equation which says that um, little f of ci times the difference between xi and xi minus 1, that is delta x, is equal to this numerator here, f of xi minus f of xi minus 1. Okay, so maybe you might agree that this line here implies this line here, but how is it that we know that we can find a ci satisfying this equation? How is it that we know that we can find a ci that satisfies this equation here? You know? This is the mean value theorem, right? We have the average rate of change over the interval xi minus 1 to xi of the function capital F. By the mean value theorem, that's equal to f prime at some point. And because this f has its derivative, this f, the derivative of capital F is little f, then I have exactly the relation I want. Okay? So when we compute our Riemann sums, we are adding up f of ci times delta x for all i between 1 and n. And we have chosen our ci's very judiciously in order to have that each product f of ci times delta x is the difference between capital F at xi and capital F of xi minus 1. OK, now when I write out this sum, it looks like this. You set i equal to 1, and you take f of x1 minus f of x0. Then you set i equal to 2, and you take f of x2 minus f of x1. Then you set i equal to 3, and you take f of x3 minus f of x2. And you keep going. You go all the way up to i equals n. So your last term will look like f of xn minus f of xn minus 1. Your second to last term will look like xn minus 1, f of xn minus 1 minus f of xn minus 2, and so on. So you don't know how many you've got. You can't write them all down, but you can sort of deduct the pattern from there. Okay. Now look carefully at this sum. It stretches out along the two lines, and you see that there's a little bit of repetition. For instance, I've got an f of x1 here, over there, and an f of x1 right here. And it's a plus f of x1 and a minus f of x1. So those two are going to combine and cancel out. They don't appear in the actual sum. What else can go away? Well, I have an f of x2 here and an f of x2 here. And again, it's a minus f of x2. So the combination of those two is going to cancel out. How about this f of x3? Well, I haven't written a minus f of x3 here, but it's inside the dot, dot, dot. Right? The next term here is going to be, let's see, f of x4 minus f of x3, and that will cancel with the f of x3 I've added there. Same thing coming out of the dot, dot, dot. The f of xn minus 2 will cancel with the first term that I'm not writing inside the dot, dot, dot. That goes away. And the f of xn minus 1 is going to cancel with the f of xn minus 1 that's there. Now what's left? Huh? What's left? I've got negative f of x0. There isn't a positive f of x0 to cancel it in, at the beginning. And I've got a positive f of xn. There isn't a negative f of xn to cancel it after the end. So all that's left are these terms, f of xn minus f of x0. But xn is just another name for the right-hand endpoint B. And x0 is just another name for the left-hand endpoint A. So this Riemann sum over n intervals does what we call telescoping. It, you can expand it all out, and then everything in the middle contracts, cancels out, and what you get is the first term minus the last term. All right. So each Riemann sum adds up to the same constant f of b minus f of a which is not usually what happens. Usually your Riemann sum depends on the number of divisions. We have chosen it in a special way so that it doesn't depend on the number of divisions. So the limit as n goes to infinity of s sub n is the limit as n goes to infinity of this difference, which doesn't depend on n. So the limit is just that difference, f of b minus f of a. And so we have the limit uh, of Riemann sums, the definite integral, is the difference between the values of the antiderivative between both endpoints. All right. So if this is not your first rodeo, if this is not your first time in Calculus 1, this is all very old news to you, and you were annoyed with me on Monday for going through the whole uh, Riemann sum rigmarole. But try to understand this from, from fresh eyes, this idea that we have two unrelated processes, the idea of finding the slope of a line tangent to the curve and finding the area of a curved region. And somehow that, ma that uh, machinery 
behind finding the uh, tangent line, the derivative, somehow comes in to the, also the computation of finding area. Okay. So now that we have this second fundamental theorem of calculus, let's look at some of the area problems that we had been discussing before and see if we can apply these new techniques. So here's one uh, region that we used Riemann sums to find the area of. It's the area between y equals x cubed above the x-axis and to the left of the line x equals 1. Okay. So remember before we did a Riemann sum, we had to look up the formula for the sum of cubes, etc. And it took several slides worth. But now what we have to do is find an antiderivative for x cubed. Lucky, luckily for me, I remember section 4.7, which I did just a week ago. And I, the antiderivative of a power function, most times, is another power function. Add 1 to the power, divide by the power. So the antiderivative of x to the cubed is x to the fourth divided by 4. Okay. Now, second fundamental theorem says take that antiderivative and evaluate it between 1 and 0, subtract those two values. Okay. Here's a nice little bit of notation. This vertical bar with the superscript and subscript mean plug in x equals 1, plug in x equals 0, subtract those two numbers. When I plug in x equals 1, I have 1 fourth, because 1 to the fourth is 1. When I plug in x equals 0, I have 0, because 0 to the fourth is 0. And the difference between those two is 1 fourth. All right, and there you have it. Far, far more easier than taking a limit of Riemann sums, right? But we got the answer, 1 fourth. Any questions about this process? It does get harder than that. But the basic idea behind finding definite integrals is that you want to find the antiderivative and subtract the values of that antiderivative between the two endpoints. Okay? So anytime we've got a function and we do the little vertical bar, superscript and subscript, that means plug in the superscript, plug in the subscript, and subtract. OK. Here's another problem that we looked at before. Find the area enclosed by the parabola y equals x squared and the line y equals 1. All right? That's the piece that's in yellow here. And this is what Archimedes did his whole magic with. So if you remember that progression on Monday, you'll remember the answer he got. I'm going to do it a little bit differently. What I will do is take the area of the entire rectangle, and I will subtract off the area of these two salmon-colored regions. And why would I do that? Well, because I can use the fact that this is the area under a curve and use an integral for that. And this is basically the same area under the curve. All right, so I can take the area of the whole rectangle, which would be 2, minus the integral between negative 1 and 1 of x squared dx. So this is half of that integral. This is the other half of that integral. OK. So I need to find an uh, antiderivative for x squared, another power function. I get x cubed over 3. Plug in x equals 1. 1 cubed over 3 is 1 third. Plug in minus 1. Negative 1 cubed over 3 is minus 1 third. 1 third minus negative 1 third is the same as 1 third plus 1 third. So I get 2 thirds. And all of this gets subtracted from 2. 2 minus 2 thirds is 4 thirds. Where did the 2 come from again? Remember what the problem is. We're finding the area enclosed by the parabola and the line y equals x. Or, the curve y equals x cubed, and the line y equals 1. So we want this piece up here. I don't have an integral formula which allows me to compute areas above curves. My formula allows me to compute areas below curves. So what I'll do is take the area of the whole rectangle, which is 2, and subtract the area under the curve. Does that make sense? OK. All right, so again, this is much easier than Archimedes' method, thanks to the fundamental theorem of calculus, you know, which we had to earn, right? We had to do it the hard way before we can do it the easy way. Other questions about this uh, process? Okay. Well, how about this one? We just estimated this integral using midpoint rules. Okay, we said it was equal to a sum of a bunch of fractions. Can we find this number exactly now that we have the fundamental theorem of calculus? OK, well, this is just a matter of finding the right antiderivative. So anyone have an antiderivative? Antiderivative of 4 over 1 plus x squared. 
the four is not that operative, right? You know, if I had an antiderivative uh, of one over one plus x squared, I could multiply it by four, and I'd be all set. Natural log? Well, not quite, because if I take the derivative of the natural log of 1 plus x squared, I need to take the derivative of 1 plus x squared, so a 2x will pop out, and I don't have a 2x there. So no dice. Good answer, but not, not quite right. Yeah? Cotangent inverse? Oh, you're getting, you're getting warm, but you're, you're too complicated. Yeah? Four times arctangent x. The derivative of arctangent is one over one plus x squared. So the derivative of four arctangent x is four times one over one plus x squared. Um, and so we can just plug it in. This is what we got the first time. We added up these fractions. And if you did it carefully, you get something like 3.1468. We are going to take the antiderivative, one over one plus x squared. Its antiderivative is arctangent x. Evaluate that between one and zero. Now, what is the arctangent of 1? That means, what is the angle whose tangent is 1? What is the angle of pi over 2? Uh, the pi, a tangent of pi over 2 is not defined because the cosine of pi over 2 is 0. But tangent being 1, tangent being 1 means that sine and cosine are the same. What angle has sine and cosine the same? 45 degrees in radians pi over 4. Pi over 4 is the arctangent of 1. And what's the arctangent of 0? 0, because sine of 0 is 0, cosine of 0 is 1, so the tangent of 0 is 0. All right, so arctangent of 1 minus arctangent of 0 is pi over 4 minus 0. And we, the difference between those is pi over 4. And we have a 4 to multiply, so this integral becomes pi. Okay, compare that to the answer that we got numerically, 3.1468. That looks like it agrees with pi, at least in the second digit. If we wanted a better approximation to pi, all we'd have to do is take more divisions in our midpoint rule. Okay, but the exact answer is that this integral is pi. So it's pretty straightforward until you get to the, the problem of finding antiderivatives. You have to be, sort of, you have to be good at, at taking antiderivatives to do this method. Uh, but it's definitely easier than computing integrals using limits of Riemann sums. Here's another one that we estimated before. We estimated that this integral was between 1 half and 1. To get it exactly, I need a function whose derivative is 1 over x. And what function would that be? Natural log. Yep. So we estimated it to be something between 1 half and 1. And now I can compute it exactly. I need the natural log of x between 2 and 1. What's the natural log of 2? I don't know. It's just some number. I mean, it's approximately 0.693 something. What's the natural log of 1? Natural log of 1 is 0 because e to the 0 is 1. All right, so I just get natural log of 2 minus 0 or natural log of 2. OK, so any Riemann sum that you would use to get close to this integral would be an estimate of the natural log of 2. Right. Great. So we also know that the integral can compute much more than just area. We gave a couple of examples. If your function that you're integrating is velocity, then the integral computes uh, displacement. In general, any time you have an integral of a derivative of something, then that integral becomes the net change of that quantity. If you're integrating a derivative, what you get back is the net change. All right, so depending on what function you have and what model you're using, what uh, context you're applying it in, you get a lot of different uh, results, which are all basically different interpretations of the fundamental theorem of calculus here. So this first one we got by saying that if, the, if we're integrating the velocity between two points in time, t0 and t1, velocity is the derivative of position. So the answer we get is the change in position over the time interval t0 to t1. Okay. Change in position is displacement. OK, so that's a nice little result. Also, if you know the marginal cost of a quantity, 
Okay, marginal cost is the derivative of total cost. So integrating marginal cost should get you a change in costs. In other words, the cost of producing x units is the cost of producing zero units plus the integral from zero to x of the marginal cost. Okay. Or you could say c of x minus c of zero is the integral of the marginal cost. Right? Okay, and notice that I'm using the letter x here, so I have a letter x here. So I can't also use x as my variable of integration, which is the only reason I changed it to q. All right, so you can compute total cost by integrating marginal cost and adding to it the fixed cost. If you have some piece of wire and it's got a varying density to it, maybe it's heavier on one side than it is on the other, then you can compute its total mass by integrating that density. Density is given in terms of uh, you know, kilograms per centimeter or grams per inch or some other combination of weight of mass divided by distance. Integrating that will give you total mass. Okay. So anytime you've got some kind of velocity or some kind of density, then, then you can integrate it and get the total change. Right? And that's why scientists care so much about integration is that you know, we've got so many things in nature which are naturally derivatives of something else and you can compute the total change by integrating that derivative. So what this is telling us is that we had better be a little bit more serious about this process of anti-differentiation. Last week when we introduced the idea of finding antiderivatives, I sort of set up this straw man, why in the world would we want to do such a thing? And the first thing I said is, well, why not? And I think now that we know that antiderivatives are uh, so useful for computing integrals, then that sort of motivates it even more. So what we'll do in terms of antiderivatives is instead of carrying around these capital letters, we'll use the integral sign again to represent antiderivatives. So normally, at least up until yesterday or Monday, we were using this integral sign with a superscript and subscript, and we said that represents the integral over this very specific interval. If the integral sign comes without any superscript and subscript, we're going to use that to mean any function whose derivative is this integrand. All right, so this indefinite integral, integral sign without any limits of integration, is another way to write antiderivative. So if I wanted, for example, if I wanted to find an antiderivative of x squared, I could write it like this. The indefinite integral of x squared dx is one third x cubed plus constant. Okay, remember that the constant of integration is important because an antiderivative is only defined up to adding or subtracting some arbitrary constant. Okay, and when you're solving problems which involve in, uh, integration, if you forget that constant that comes in, you can actually lose answers and not get the right solution. So always important to include the constant of integration that comes in. Okay. So all of our antiderivatives that we've learned so far can be rewritten as indefinite integrals. And that's often called a table of integrals, a long list of antiderivatives. If you have your textbook and you look in the end papers in the back, you're going to see three or four pages of formulas which look like this. So we had written them before in terms of capital letters, but you can't write capital letters forever. So the indefinite integral notation is a little bit more flexible. Let's go through some of these and see what they're telling us. The antiderivative of a sum of two functions is the sum of antiderivatives. That's just the derivative rule in reverse. And some rule for derivatives in reverse. Here's the power rule for uh, and for and the, and, yeah, the power rule for antiderivatives. Antiderivative x to the n is x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1, as long as that power is not minus 1. Antiderivative of x to the minus 1 is the natural log of the absolute value of x. Uh, constants pull through. That's a general rule we know. Integral of e to the x is e to the x. Integral of a to the x is a to the x divided by the natural log of a. Uh, integral of sine is negative cosine. Integral of cosine is sine. These are just the reverse forms of the rules which say the derivative of sine is cosine and the derivative of cosine is negative sine. These other two formulas here are the reverse of the formulas that the derivative of tangent is secant squared and the derivative of secant is secant tangent. Oh, and here's our friend arctan. The derivative of arctan is 1 over 1 plus x squared. So the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus x squared is arctangent. 
here's arc sine, and did I write arc cosine? I didn't, because it's just the opposite of that. All right. Okay. So this is just the beginning to a list of integrals that you can use for computing antiderivatives. Now, it's kind of ad hoc. I mean, it's nice that we have a general rule for antiderivatives of power functions and for antiderivatives of exponential functions. We only have a general rule for antiderivatives of trig functions in the case of sine and cosine. I don't have yet a formula for antiderivative of tangent. Right? And that's because in my list of derivatives, I don't have any derivatives where the answer is tangent. So, so far, no antiderivative for tangent or cotangent or secant or cosecant. But if I'm lucky enough to have the square of secant, I know that that's the derivative of something. Or secant time tangent, I know that that's the derivative of something too. Okay? So we don't have a complete list, but this is the beginning. For the full story, you have to take Calc 2. Now, I mentioned that I'm teaching Calc 2 Tuesdays and Thursdays. No, nope, Monday and Wednesdays, 2 p.m. in the fall term of 11. Okay. So let's look at a few uh, applications of this. Computing area with these integrals. Okay. First problem, find the area of the region bounded by the lines x equals 1, x equals 4, the x-axis, and the curve y equals e to the x. Don't worry about this. This is just some computer code that got onto the slide for some reason. Okay, find the area of the region bounded by the lines x equals 1, x equals 4, the x-axis, and the curve y equals x. What kind of line is x equals 1? Is that a horizontal line or a vertical line? It's a vertical line. Even though it's x equals 1 and x is the horizontal co coordinate, the set of all points with the same x coordinate, that is a vertical line. So the picture would be um, between the vertical lines, x equals 1, x equals 4, above the x-axis and below the curve y equals e to the x. So the answer that you get is, well, what's the antiderivative of e to the x? e to the x has the best antiderivative in the world. It's itself. So I take that antiderivative e to the x. I plug in x equals 4. I plug in x equals 1. I subtract them. I get e to the fourth minus e to the 1 or e to the fourth minus e. Okay? Can't really do any more simplification there. That's what it is. Okay. Questions about that one? That one wasn't too bad because it had a nice antiderivative. How about the uh, area of the region bounded by the curve y equals arc sine x, the x-axis, and the line x equals 1? Well... We don't have an antiderivative for arc sine, do we? If you look back at the table of integrals, we had we know the derivative of arc sine, but we don't know an antiderivative for arc sine. Well, what can we do here? What we can do is turn our head sideways. Because if I could look at the graph of arc sine, arc sine is the inverse of something, right? What is it the inverse of? Sine. All right. So if this is the graph of arc sine, and I look in the other direction, treat y as the independent variable and x as the dependent variable, then x is equal to the sine of y. This is the definition of arc sine. If y is arc sine x, x equals the sine of y. So what I can do is find the area of the rectangle and subtract the area that's under this curve here. And I put under in finger quotes because when I'm turning my head and then thinking about under the curve, I'm actually looking to the left of the curve. Right? If I'm turning my head and you're not, then what's below the curve for me is to the left for you. So if I do the, an integral to find the area of the salmon colored region here and subtract it from the area of the entire rectangle, what will be left over is the area that we wanted in the first place, the area under arc sine. Does that sound like a plan? OK. What's the area of the whole rectangle? pi over 2, because the area is just the length times the height, right? The length is 1, and the height is pi over 2. What's the area of this salmon-colored region? Well, it's the integral from y equals 0 to y equals pi over 2 of sine of y. All right? So it's pi over 2 minus the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of sine of y. Okay, pi over 2 just sort of sits there. Uh, the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. Important to remember the negative sign there. What is the cosine of pi over 2? Also important. 
cos cosine of pi over 2 is 0. What is the cosine of 0? 1. So I'm taking pi over 2 minus a negative 1. So if you do those in the right, count the minus signs in the right way, you get pi over 2 minus 1. There's a minus sign here, there's a minus sign here, and there's another minus sign which comes from the fact that we subtract the antiderivative with 0 plugged in. So three minus signs give you a minus. OK. Questions about that one? Yeah. Was that for the area above or below? Well, this integral <coughs> measures the area of the, the, the salmon colored region here. Okay. If I take that integral and subtract it from pi over 2, then I'm subtracting the area of the entire rectangle minus the area of the salmon, and that's the area of the gold, which is what I wanted. Okay? So salmon colored region has area pi over 2. The whole rectangle has area, sorry, uh, salmon colored region has the area 1. Whole rectangle has area pi over 2. So this leftover piece has area pi over 2 minus 1. Okay. Here's one for you to try. Find the area between the graph of y equals x minus 1 times x minus 2, the x-axis, and the two vertical lines, x equals 0 and x equals 3. Okay? So between two curves means that it's got to be above one curve and below the other curve. And we want to compute the whole area between these two curves. Uh, well, one curve is this parabola, and the other curve is the x-axis. Okay? So to set up the problem, you really need to graph it first. Once you graph it, you'll see what kind of integral you have to do, and then, then you go ahead and do the, that, that integral there. So I'm going to give you some time to work on this. OK, so how many of you got uh, three halves or one and a half? OK, very good. That's the most popular wrong answer, which means that you, you have half of it right, which is better than having something you know, totally wrong, right? Mostly partially wrong, which is almost like mostly right. Okay. What you need to do, I told you that you had to graph it, right? And when you graph it, you see what the actual problem is. How am I supposed to graph this function? Well, it's a parabola because the, uh, the curve is quadratic, right? It's an x squared something. And the fact that I factored it means that you know it goes through the points 1, 0, and 2, 0. So you don't have to do any fancy calculus graphing. This is pre-calculus level graphing. You know it goes through these points. It goes up and down. All right. And then here's the lines x equals 0 and x equals 3. So we want the area of this region, which is broken up into three pieces. Now, if you just find an antiderivative of this function and plug in 3, plug in 0, and subtract them, then what you will get is the area of this region and the area of this region <coughs> minus the area of this region, because you see it's under the x-axis. Right? So integrating this function from 1 to 2 will give me a negative number the opposite of the area here. So to counteract that negativity, right, to accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative, we will integrate this piece in the regular way. We'll subtract the integral of this piece to make sure that the negative becomes positive, And then we'll add the integral of this piece. Okay, so we have to take three integrals here. One of them is the integral um, from 0 to 1. The other one is the integral from 2 to 3. And then we subtract the integral from 1 to 2. Okay? And if you multiply out x minus 1 times x minus 2, you get x squared minus 3x plus 2. Factored is the better way to graph, but expanded is the better way to integrate, because we're just going to use the power rule. Okay? So it looks like I've got three integrals to do, but they're all integrals of the same function, so the antiderivatives are all the same. They're all 1 third x cubed minus 3 halves x squared plus 2x. Okay, we take that, plug in 1, plug in 0, subtract, take it, that, plug in 2, plug in 1, subtract them, then subtract that difference, plug in 3, plug in 2, and subtract those. And if you add up all that, then you get 11 sixths. Okay, basically the area of this piece is 5 sixths, the area of this piece is 5 sixths, and the area of this piece is 1 sixth. So if you're counting them in the right signs, you take 5, 6 plus 5, 6 plus 1, 6. If you forget to count them with the right signs, this one ends up negative, And you'll be taking 5, 6 plus 5, 6 minus 1, 6. That results in 9, 6, which is your 3 halves. Okay? 
So remember that if your function extends below the x-axis and you want to find the area under that curve, you probably want the negative of that integral to make sure you get a positive. OK, questions about that procedure? I know it's kind of tricky, but I did tell you I had to graph it, right? OK. And this, this property actually has an analog when you think about di uh, the integral as uh, distance, because velocity has a direction to it. You can be going uh, a certain speed forwards or backwards. And the integral is going to measure how much forwards you went minus how much backwards you went. And so the integral of velocity is net distance traveled. If I drive 60 miles in this direction, and then 30 miles in the other direction, then the net I've traveled is 60 miles, in, or, sorry, 30 miles in this direction. On the other hand, if I want to look at the total distance traveled, that would include the 60 plus the 30 coming back, that answer would be 90. And to integrate, I would be integrating not, not, not the velocity, but the speed, the absolute value of the velocity. All right, so what we're doing here, basically we're integrating the absolute value of the function x minus 1 times x minus 2. We subtract the function where it becomes a negative. And so integrating the absolute value of velocity gets you total distance traveled. OK. Now what about that constant? I, I went on at length about the fact that any time you took an antiderivative, you had to add an arbitrary constant. OK. When we did this integration here, we didn't add an arbitrary constant. When we did, let's see, this integral here, we didn't add a constant. Uh, when we did this one here, we didn't add a constant. So what's the deal? Why did I make a big deal about it and then not do it myself? Well, look what happens if you take the same antiderivative but add a constant. Say you want to find the area uh, under the curve of x cubed, and you take as your antiderivative x to the fourth over 4 plus constant. Well, you plug in 1. You get 1 fourth plus constant. Plug in 0. You get 0 fourths plus constant. Subtract them, and it's 1 fourth minus 0 plus constant minus constant. The constants will actually cancel. No matter what constant we take as our constant of integration, if we're doing a definite integral that is plugging in the two endpoints and subtracting, that constant is going to disappear. So upshot is, for purposes of integration, or purposes of finding area, or computing definite integrals, then the constant is not that big a deal when finding antiderivatives. In other situations where we'll be finding antiderivatives, whether it's velocity or solving differential equations, then the constant is very important, okay? Which is why we make a point about emphasizing there has to be a constant there. It doesn't have to be there for computing definite integrals, but in other cases, it should be there. Okay, so what have we learned? We learned the second fundamental theorem of calculus. The first one will be coming on Monday. Uh, we learned that definite integrals can be interpreted as net change in lots of different situations. And we're now going to rebrand our antiderivatives as indefinite integral.